All right, so neonatal brain bleeds, also known as intraventricular hemorrhages, occur in 45% of extreme premature neonates. Uh, the catothalamic groove is the beginning point for these bleeds. Uh, it is thought to be caused by impaired auto-regulation. 96% of all bleeds are going to happen in the first four days of life. And out of those, 80% progress into higher grade bleeds. All right, the risk factors for bleeds are prematurity. That's the, num the number one risk factor. Less than 34 weeks gestation and less than 1,500 grams in weight. Uh, rapid fluctuations in blood pressure, especially in neonates. Rapid changes in blood volume transfer from outside facilities, coagulopathies, respiratory distress, and hypoxia or hypoxic ischemic events at birth. All right, so the grading system has four grades with grade one being the germinal matrix or subependymal hemorrhage. And it's the most mildest form. If this does not progress into a grade two, usually they resolve and the kids usually de de develop no secondary neuro neurological developmental disorders. Grade 2 is intraventricular hemorrhage without ventricular dilatation. So the bleed breaks through the ventricular lining and goes into the ventricle, but does not cause hydrocephalus. Grade 3 is intraventricular hemorrhage with ventricular dilatation. And grade 4 is brain bleed within the parenchyma. So a hemorrhage within the actual brain tissue. Right. So grade 1, you can see on this image here, this is a premature infant, very smooth brain. You can see in the left, the right side of the image, there's that dark spot there. That's a grade one subependymal hemorrhage. They are typically less than one centimeter. If the bleed does not progress to higher grades, the outcome is similar to neonates that do not develop bleeds. However, 80% of grade one bleeds do progress. All right, here's a neonate, 31 week gestational age. There you can see he had, there's bilateral grade one bleeds. The blue arrows are pointing to the subependymal regions in coronal and then on the right in sagittal and you can see the echogenic blood within the subependymal region so this is a grade one now you can see that the echogenicity of the blood is very similar to that of the chorea plexus but the chorea plexus does not begin in the catothalamic groove it begins about one third of the way or, or halfway to the thalamus so that's something to consider all right here's another grade one 31 week gestational age, about 1,500 grams of birth. There you see the blue arrow pointing to the catothalamic groove in sagittal, parasagittal, and there's an echogenic mass there, that's blood. All right, so here's the grade one bleed that over time has developed cystic changes. This is cystic degeneration. This happens over time and it's a sign that the bleed is not acute. There you see there's two bleeds, both sides, they're both grade ones, hasn't broken into the ventricle yet. And the one on the left side, which would be the right ventricle has undergone more cystic changes than the one on the left. All right, so on to grade two. Grade two bleeds, rupture the ventricular lining, and the blood goes into the ventricle. So you have intraventricular hemorrhage at this point, so blood within the ventricles without ventricular megaly. All right, so the blood can increase within the ventricle and make a cast of the actual ventricle itself. Here's a coronal and sagittal image of a grade two. There you can see on the left image is a coronal, and within the left ventricle there's blood, and here's a sagittal image and you can see there's a, a decent amount of blood within the ventricle there All right another grade two here's the initial ultrasound showing the echogenic blood within the ventricle and then two weeks later you can see the blood is starting to become hypoechoic as it degenerates and then two months later you see there's no blood within the ventricle however there is this echogenic spot here which appears to be adhered to the to the chorea plexus. So that is probably just a calcified retracted clot. Okay, so on to grade three. So grade three is intraventricular hemorrhage with ventricular megaly. The ventricular lining can become echogenic once the blood starts to irritate the ventricular lining. This, re this reflects ventriculitis. Neonates with grade three hemorrhages have a 20% increase in mortality. And 35% of patients with grade three go on to develop neurological deficits. Okay, so here you can see bilateral sagittal views of the ventricles you can see the temporal horns you can see the occipital horns and you can see that it's completely filled with echogenic fluid that looks like debris that's fresh blood and then there's a big mass there within the ventricle that's also blood that's hyperechoic and then this is the other side in this ventricle you can see the blood is echogenic is those low level echoes all within the ventricles and then 
that echogenic part is actually the cori plexus. So you know the difference. There might be blood adhered to that as well because this cori plexus is thicker than the one on the on the on the left side of the image. So there could be adhered blood. Uh, so there could be clot adhered to the cori plexus there. Here's another grade three. You can see the ventricular running, especially on the lower parts, is uh, becoming echogenic, which could be reflecting uh, ventriculitis from the irritation of the blood within the ventricle. All right on the left ventricle, there's a large clot, and on the left ventricle sagittal, you can see that large clot with the center of it becoming hypoechoic, and over time, it, w it will liquefy. All right, this is the same patient three months later. You see the ventricle is a little prominent, not necessarily uh, enlarged. And you see there's no longer blood within the ventricles. So, so the outcome of this was pretty good. Uh, it didn't progress to a grade 4. The parenchyma looks pretty decent. All right, so now moving on to grade 4. Grade 4 is an intraparenchymal bleed. It used to be thought that it was just a progression of grade 3 bleeds that would break through the ventricle and go into the brain. However, it is now thought that it is uh, has that it happens due to white matter venous infarctions. Once the blood in the brain heals, a cystic cavity is formed within the brain that fills with cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, these are called encephalomalacia or poor encephalic cysts. Grade 4 bleeds result in 50% increase in mortality and a 90% increase in neurological deficits of all types of severity. Here's a 27 week gestation. You can see this grade 4 bleed is quite large. It's on the right side and the right hemisphere of the brain. You can see it's causing midline shift. And on the sagittal image you can see just the large amount of blood within the brain. You can also see that this brain is very smooth, which has to do with extreme prematurity at 27 weeks. All right, here's another grade four. Initial exam. Echogenicity is within the left periventricular white matter, which results in hemorrhage formation. All right, and then at a four month interval, you see what's left over is just a large cystic area that connects to the left ventricle. And that is a large cystic encephalomalacia or poor encephalic cyst. Here's another intraventricular hemorrhage within the brain at grade four over a 28 day period. You see the brain is very smooth on day one, very smooth, very premature brain, barely any gyri or sulci. And then day three, this large clot forms from the right side of the brain. Okay, day four, the clot increases. You can see there's a large amount of clot within the ventricle, and there's a large amount of blood within the actual parenchyma. At day seven, you can see the the blood is already undergoing cystic changes within the center. Within, within the center, and then on day 28, the blood has become more hypochoic and is undergoing cystic changes. You see there's ventricular megaly as well. Once there's blood within the ventricles, it can become trapped within the lower chambers of the fourth ventricle or third ventricle causing an obstructive hydrocephalus, which is called post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, which results from mechanical obstruction from blood septations or debris. The trigone and occipital horn of the lateral ventricles usually dilate first. Incidence in surviving infants is estimated at 15 to 22%, and the dilatation resolves in 50 to 75% of patients, while 15% of patients require ventricular peritoneal shunting or reservoir placement. All right, so that's it for brain bleeds. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Uh, please don't forget to hit the like button, comment, hit the notification bell, and subscribe. This will go along with a blog post that will be at sonographictendencies.com. Thank you. Bye.